When you introduce a speaker with Akil Amar's background, it is difficult to choose what accolades to include and what to leave out. Suffice it to say, I left out more in this introduction um, than you will hear. Akhil Reed Amar is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law in both Yale College and Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale, you notice a theme, summa cum laude in 1980, and then from Yale Law School in 1984, and then clerking for then judge, now Justice Stephen Breyer, Amar joined the Yale faculty in 1985 at the age of 26. Amar's work has won awards from both the American Bar Association and the Federalist Society. And he's been cited by Supreme Court justices across the spectrum in more than four dozen cases. He regularly testifies before Congress at the invitation of both parties. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has written widely for popular publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Time, and the Atlantic. He is the author of more than 100 law review articles and several books. His latest, The Reason That We're Here, is the most ambitious book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. And he's recently launched a weekly podcast, America's Constitution. So if you feel like you're a slacker, you are. <laughs> But I want to add something that you won't find in his bio. He is a man of unfailing decency and kindness. Yesterday, he was speaking with Justice Kavanaugh, and tonight, he is at the Colleges of Law. He insisted that he pay his own way, his flight, his hotel, his rental car. The only thing he asked of us was that we made his book available to every student. And his generosity has made a difference already. One student told me, and this is a quote, he is an amazing writer. I have struggled with constitutional law, especially with cases that are centuries old. Reading his book gave me confidence and a sort of permission to allow my brain to learn about a time when my ancestors may have suffered at the hands of these gentlemen. He cracked the code through. To me, that is the most important accolade that an educator can have. So please welcome Akil Amar. Thank you, Chuck. Where do you want me to stand? A um, uh, gentleman was telling me to stand. Right here is good? OK. It's an honor to be with you all. I'm a Californian. Grew up in Northern California, but my family is relocated down here. Um, it was special uh, this morning to be able to uh, see my, and I'm staying with him, my 94 and a half year old father who uh, um, is living in an assisted living center in Tarzana, which is almost exactly um, on uh, midpoint on the road from LAX to Ventura, so perfect geography here. The book, th I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I have an ulterior motive. You see, I, I, um, I'm a little bit like a, a, a drug dealer who gives you, you know, <laughs> um, a free sample. I want you to be hooked on the American Constitutional Project the way I am. So I want you to read the book. That, it's an expensive book. And the expense is not the purchase price, it's your time, because that's the most valuable thing we have in this life. You know, and I think about that when I see my dad. Um, and this is a long book. It's one of many books that I've written. And I want you to experience it, and you can listen to it on audiobook. It starts a little slow, truthfully, but I think it picks up. Um, I have a free podcast. There are 150, you heard about that? There are 149 episodes. It's weekly. It's absolutely free. Those of you who are already lawyers, you can get at least, well, 
actually, I, I'm not sure about California, which doesn't have always reciprocity with all the other states, but for almost all the other states, you can get CLE credit just for listening to the podcast. You have to check um, if California is part of that consortium. But 149 episodes, sometimes we have guests. Um, they're from across the political spectrum. Uh, you want to hear from Bob Woodward? Um, he, he came on a couple of episodes. Gary Hart, Linda Greenhouse, uh, conservatives like uh, Ed Whalen, the two conservative Federalist Society types who uh, wrote this important article saying Donald Trump is not eligible for the presidency under 14th Amendment Section 3. We've got them on our podcast. They didn't do MSNBC. They didn't do CNN. They didn't do Fox because they're serious and we have serious conversations on our podcast. Um, so I want you to become hooked on the Constitution. I'll tell you why in five minutes and then actually we're going to have a conversation. You're going to ask me questions and maybe I'll read a portion of the book that's responsive to your answer or I'll tell you about this podcast episode or some other book or article or essay um, that might give you more information because there's no way in the short time that we have that we can cover all the constitutional ground. One person, Dina, has already asked me a question. I said, oh, I actually disagree with what you've been taught about this. Uh, so facts are important. We've got to wrestle them to the ground. And here's why, and, and especially uh, about the Constitution. Because it's the only thing that we have in common. We Americans are remarkably diverse. Uh, it's an overused word, but um, some of our families came yesterday. My family came pretty recently to America. Other families have been here for 250 years or more. Some people's ancestors came with bull whips in their hands. Other people's ancestors came in chains. Other people's ancestors were dispossessed by the ancestors of of some of the rest of us. Um, we don't have race in common. We don't have religion in common. We don't even all speak English as our um, first and most natural and native language. Um, politically, we're miles apart. Geographically, we are um, a continent um, with every bit as much diversity and range as Europe. Um, so, what holds us together? And the answer, it seems to me, is the Constitution or nothing. And nothing is a real possibility. And if so, America dies, and it can die in our generation. And I think if it dies, the world dies. Because I'm going to now just tell you a little bit about where this book fits in. Um, this book is called The Words That Made Us. It's a pun. Us can be we, as in we the people. Us can also be the United States. It's how the United States became united. Before this book begins, there's no real America. They're just different colonies. They happen to have a common crown, but they don't have much in common with each other. They don't talk to each other. Massachusetts does not talk to Virginia and South Carolina when this book begins in 1760. They all have a common crown, but no common connectivity. It would be like um, those of you who watch The Crown, the, the uh, 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 series, and it's a great series. It's like the British Empire circa 1930. Well, there's India, and there's Canada, and there's Kenya, and there's New Zealand and Australia, and they're all part of the British Commonwealth, and they're all connected to a common crown, but they don't have a common um, denominator uh, or a common culture among themselves. That's America in 1760. And then, actually, this book tells you about how we become a we of a certain sort. And these are not my ancestors, okay? But I can choose, if I want, to affiliate with the project. And I choose to do so in part because if I don't, I don't have anything in common with the people around me who inhabit this continent. At the time the Constitution is launched, I want to now tell you a story about the world, big picture story. The world divides 
into BC and AD, by which I mean before the Constitution and after the document. <laughs> before we the people put the thing, adopt a Constitution. We, see, we put it to a vote. We the people do ordain and establish this Constitution. We actually did something. We put it to a vote up and down the continent and we talked to each other for a year and debated it and some people lost and they accepted that. They didn't actually try to stop the steal because they, they somehow claimed it was invalid because facts are important and we have to get our facts right. And I'm a Democrat and I don't think the Garland seat was stolen, you see, on the other side. And so when one side said, oh, the Garland seat was stolen, no, it wasn't. He didn't have the votes in the Senate and that's that and we can talk about that. And the election wasn't stolen either. And if one side said, oh, the election was stolen, oh my God, how are we going to live together? So facts are important. We have to get our facts right. Here's a big fact. It was put to a vote up and down a continent, and the world had never seen anything like that before. There were only a few democracies in the history of the world before um, the 1770s, and none of them, just a few, Athens under the Cleisthenic constitution of, of Pericles and Socrates. Um, and um, uh, Rome before it um, deteriorated into uh, an empire uh, with Caesars when it was uh, still a, a republic. Um, a few self-governing societies, the Swiss a bit, the Brits a bit, that's it before Americans launch their revolution, but even the societies that had some democracy, some self-governance, like Britain, like Switzerland, never had democratic constitutions adopted by the citizenry. Not one. Put things down in writing and then voted on it. So the constitution, which is not just a text, um, I'm going to reach here and show you, you know, it's, it's a short text, okay? But it's the deed, it's the doing, it's the constituting, it's an ordainment, an establishment. It's an epic deed. A whole continent for a whole year talking to each other, um, agreeing on something, the losers actually acquiescing, and the winners listening to the losers because the losers had a point. We call that the Bill of Rights. See, like imagine that, you know, winners listening to losers, losers not trying to walk away. This deed, Akil says, was the big bang of human history. The world divides, the world had never seen anything like that before. And the words are so familiar to you, you don't even remember what they're saying. We, the people, do ordain and establish this constitution. You say, well, what do you mean we, pale face? Who's this we? Okay, because there was slavery, and we could talk about Native American exclusion and disposition, dispossession, and women didn't vote, but if you judge it by the standards of 1786 or 1785, or 1685 or 1585, never before had so many people been allowed to vote on how they and their posterity would be governed. In New York, for example, in eight of the, of the 13 states, the ordinary rules for voting didn't apply. Uh, there were broader rules of inclusiveness. In New York, for example, all adult free male citizens get to vote on the Constitution. No race tests, no religious tests, no literacy tests, no property tests, that's pretty darn good for New York in 1787 compared to the ordinary rules. From today's perspective, it's pathetic because what about women? And there was, there was um, slavery in New York and elsewhere, but it's the Big Bang because you can't get to today without going through that Big Bang, that epic democratic moment of inclusion. And so today, Half the world is democratic by population and land mass. That wasn't true with the Constitution. There was only Britain and Switzerland, and that's it. And this is because of, not just after, but because of the success of the American Constitutional Project. And the rest of the world is struggling democratically. India is not perfect, but when my dad was born, and I just saw him two hours ago, but when he was born 94 and a half years ago, 
under the British Raj, the British rule, there was a king from halfway across the world telling him what to do and no one voted for him, and a parliament telling him what to do in India and no one voted for them, and that's the American revolutionaries you see in 1775, but, but that was India when my dad was born, and today it's a billion with a B. People governing themselves imperfectly to be sure, but with a written constitution and free and relatively fair elections and multiple parties alternating in par power and at least some religious liberty and a bill of rights and a rule of law and courts on an American model and wow. And that's not just true of India, we could talk about Japan, we could talk about Central Europe. When the constitution is adopted, France is an absolutist monarchy. You know, and today it's a pretty impressive republic, truthfully. It's not as impressive as California, it's not. Um, California treats its religious minorities better. Some people say our wine is just as good, I wouldn't know. Um, um, but I can tell you um, that truthfully, don't tell this to a French person, but the counterpart of France in the world is not the United States, it's California. Ca counterpart of the United States would be all of Europe. Um, now, um, Ukrainians are struggling to breathe free, and, and so are people in Central Europe. So half the world today is democratic, and this is because of the Big Bang. You live in a democratic world because of what happened in a certain time and place in the 1760s and 1770s and 1780s in America. The world was made, the modern world, in America. Again, they don't understand that, but that's actually true. There's BC and there's AD and you need to study it even if you're in India or France to understand actually how the modern world came about. But here's why you also need to study it. Because if you're an American, it's the only thing we have in common. And they, they, they made a lot of mistakes and there were a lot of um, omissions. That's why we have amendments that made amends over the years adding a Bill of Rights, ending slavery, um, uh, 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 enfranchising women. So stay tuned, there are two more volumes where this <laughs> comes from. There's the Two Towers and, and the Return of the King um, <laughs> that um, uh, still await. I'm in the middle of Two Towers now. It's called Born Equal. It's all about Lincoln and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass and Harriet Beecher Stowe and oh, an amazing cast of characters. And if you don't know about those people, then you don't have anything in common with your fellow citizens, because that's actually what we have, is this common narrative, this common constitutional saga. Here's the last point on that. You see, because what makes a special professor if the rest of the world is actually moving toward democracy? Because none of them are multicultural immigrant societies. No other great democracy in the world, or almost none, is actually trying to make it work with the great-grandchildren of all the other peoples of the world. That's what makes it so much harder for us to do than the Swedes, you know, who have um, not very much religious, uh, ethnic, cultural diversity. Um, not so much the French, truth be told. They have an Algerian problem, but they don't have um, um, all the peoples of all the world tr coming together in, in France. Canada, a bit, um, but not so much anywhere else in the world. India has lots of different languages and cultures, but it's not an immigrant society. They have, they're producing too many of their own to, to, to <laughs> they, they're all my cousins and, you know. Uh, so, so we have, a special opportunity and a special challenge, we Americans. We are the world in a way that no other country is, and I think we're failing. And I honestly think we're failing in part because we don't know our own history at all. We don't. And we know, I promise you, most people, if I walk out there, can say more intelligent things about the Rangers, you know, um, um, uh, and the Phillies and the, the Astros and um, then they can about um, uh, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, who was a complicated character 
Abraham Lincoln. Every four years, we're the hiring committee. We actually pick the president who picks the justices. And if we don't know what the president is supposed to be and do and look like, because we don't know the job description, because the first thing he or she has to do is to take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And if we don't know what that is and, and why it is, then how is that going to work? Okay, so cards on the table, and then I'll take your questions. My grand plan for world domination <laughs> is that I'm going to write books that tell the history straight. They're not my personal views at all, and it's not about my forebears. They weren't even here. Okay, so I'm going to try to get it straight, get it right. I'm sure I'm going to make mistakes, but they'll be honest mistakes, sometimes on the left, Sometimes on the right, you can tell the story of America. That's my job, is to write the darn thing. And your job is to read it. And once you've read it, to put a five-star review up on Amazon or Goodreads, <laughs> and to tell all your friends. And eventually, people will learn this in high school. And when you meet a fellow st um, American, you'll be able to talk about more than, you know, how about them Rangers, OK? Um, and I've got nothing against the Texas Rangers. Um, so, um, so that's why, cards on the table, I said, actually, I, I can pay my own way out here, give books, put books into people's hands, but now you've got to read them. OK, what would you like to talk about? Isn't it time to rewrite the Constitution? Oh, isn't it time to rewrite the Constitution? Not until you've read it, okay? Not until you know it backwards and frickin' forwards and sideways, because maybe, actually, it's possible that it's smarter than you are and smarter than I am. And before we go around messing with the thing, and it needs messing with, we need to know why they did what, where they screwed up, where they didn't, what amendments have been made, did they work or not. OK, so you can't do that unless you know what it already is and isn't and why. OK, so you could say president has to be 35 years. That's undemocratic. Why shouldn't we be allowed to vote for whoever we want? That's more equal. Well, it turns out that there are some reasons. Now, do you know what they are? Because you will when you read the book. Ah, why do we have it 35 years old? Because who would get elected? Who would have the name recognition to be elected president at the age of 30? Only a famous son of a famous father. And that isn't very egalitarian. This is actually affirmative action for lowborn people. They've got a chance to show their stuff. And other people have a chance, famous people, to have a track record of their own that they can be judged by. So they don't become president just because their name is Donald Trump Jr. at age 32. Or Chelsea Clinton. Or John Quincy Adams, who actually, by the time he's elected, has a track record of his own. None of the early framers had a son, the early presidents, except one. His name was John Adams, and you've heard of his son. His name is Q, as in W. That's a George W. Bush joke, you see. OK. So before we go around messing with the thing, because this is what I thought when I was young, I thought, well, actually, because you know, I thought, oh, I have all these good ideas. It could be so much better. And you know what? It could be way worse, too. And you all in California should know about amendments that make the system way worse, OK? Because I grew up pre-Prop 13, and California was better before that. So before you go around messing with shit, know why you have the existing shit. That's the, that's the point, because it's so, and it's not about you or you or me. It's about us. And we need to know the story of us before. And then we will know who we are as a people, where we came from, and where we need to go. I'm thinking a lot about my friends in Israel these days. And every year, for 
thousands of years, Jews all around, I've been fortunate enough to go to various seders, Jews around the world come together and recollect themselves, remember who they are as a people. Um, and the story is told about things that happened 7,000 years ago, maybe more, um, uh, uh, under Pharaoh. And, and, and what happened, and they, they remember, ah, this is our identity. This is who we are. And, and then if you don't know who you are, imagine, suppose you woke up tomorrow with total amnesia. You know, you wouldn't know who your spouse is, you know, who your children are. Um, you'd be totally lost. That's, that's true of an individual. It's true of a people as well. So we need, actually, the story of America. And then we can decide whether we want to toss the whole thing overboard and just change it. Because other generations have made dramatic changes. And many of them have been the glories of our system. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, ending slavery, promising civil rights for all African Americans. And in fact, it doesn't just say race. Um, the 15th Amendment, ending racial discrimination in the political sphere, voting, jury service. The 19th Amendment, OK. Um, some amendments haven't been so successful. That 18th Amendment prohibition thing didn't work so well. Why not? Other amendments have come close to being passed and weren't. And I say, oh, I'm so glad they weren't, because I testified against an amendment that came this close to being passed, my friend, pushed by George W. Bush. Um, and he wanted, and his coalition, and they almost succeeded to put in your and my lifetime an amendment in the Constitution that would have made marriage in the Constitution one man, one woman, that's it. Oh, so be careful what you wish for, because not all change is good change. Not all amendments would be good amendments, so you need to study which ones have worked and why, which good ideas came close to being passed and didn't, which bad ideas came close to being passed and didn't. I'd want you eventually to look at your state constitutions as well and to try to see which ones, which re amendments have actually been good ones and bad ones. And on that, the last chapter of a book I wrote in 2012 called America's Unwritten Constitution takes you through various state constitutions and the amendments and said, let's look at those amendments and we can predict which amendments of the federal constitution will succeed. Almost everything in the federal constitution states did first. They had, a, they had constitutions first. They, some of them got rid of slavery first. They let women vote first. So, so that's what we need to do before we actually change the federal rules, we have a lot of homework to do first. And then we, have to, then we have to talk to each other, and then we can move forward. Can you come, come up um, and, and, uh, so that everyone can hear you? Um, so I was at an environmental conference last week, and um, they were saying that the, the next wave of attack on environmental regulations is to say that the Endangered Species Act is not constitutional. And um, it was disconcerting um, to be sitting in a conference and lawyers were meant to be protecting environmental resources kind of feel like their hands are tied because of our current Supreme Court majority. And, and you know, we were actually cautioned by speakers, be careful about what litigation you bring, you know, be careful about the jurisprudence that might be developed. And um, I'm really just asking for how do we navigate um, with what the repercussions of what certain decisions can be um, effectively to still protect the Constitution um, and also, you know, everything that ripple effects from that. So is the Environmental Protection Act unconstitutional? I don't think so. My first, actually, um, big job um, in law school um, Work was as an attorney for the uh, as a summer uh, associate of the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC, 
here in California. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what part of the EPA or um, most um, environmental laws would be unconstitutional. I can't prove the negatives. You have to tell me what specifically they were saying was unconstitutional. But I'm going to be straight with you. There are a lot of people out there who are saying a lot of things. They can't all be right. Okay? And everyone's a damn expert on the Twitterverse. Okay? <laughs> but many people don't know what they are talking about. So you need to be much more educated consumers of information. And you can't be so credulous. Just because someone said it is a conference doesn't necessarily mean it's so. So you need to know, honestly, oh, Kilimar is very opinionated. Why should I listen to his opinions? And I'll tell you why, OK? Because, the, because if you were going to plonk down your money for some investment, you'd actually do your due diligence. And if you don't, you'd have lost all your money in FTX with Sam Bankman Freed. <laughs> OK? And I say, I don't understand blockchain. Um, I don't understand why we need this crypto. I'm not putting my money in that. OK? Because I actually did my due diligence, and, and I still have my money. <laughs> OK? So listen to me. Because I don't believe what they said about the Supreme Court. And you can say, well, you're corrupt because you've been cited by the Supreme Court. I say, yes, but I'm a liberal. I'm an environmentalist. And I win when I actually make arguments to the Supreme Court. So I don't think that they are on the verge of holding unconstitutional environmental statutes across the board. They may have narrowly construed a law about what's called WOTUS. POTUS is the President of the United States. SCOTUS is the Supreme Court of the United States. FLOTUS is the First Lady of the United States. WOTUS are the waters of the United States. There was a statute. It's about wetlands, and it's about whether an inland wetland has to have a continuous surface connection to a navigable waterway. And actually, the West has a different um, system um, of, of, uh, than the East, because we have here in California arroyos, dry ditches that are dry 355 days a year. But oh, when there is a flash flood, there are raging rivers. So, um, but that's not a constitutional case. That's a statutory case. Congress could change that tomorrow, regulating the waters of the United States. So, so when you need to tell me a little bit more about what specifically they are saying is unconstitutional about our environmental laws, because I'm not seeing it, and I'm not counting to five there. I can tell you, if you listen to the podcast, what was the, it didn't happen happily, but there was a challenge last year. It was a, the, the biggest case was about a thing called the Independent State Legislature Doctrine. How many of you heard of, about ISL? Raise your hands. Here's why it was important. Because a bunch of people were saying, if Wisconsin wants to, if Georgia wants to, there are a bunch of states that have red legislatures, but maybe purple, definitely, uh, maybe blue, definitely purple electorates. And there were a bunch of people saying, if the Wisconsin legislature wants to, it can basically pick presidential electors itself rather than letting the people of Wisconsin do it. If the Georgia legislature wants to, it could do that. If the Arizona legislature wants to, it could do that. And if they can do that, just to be clear, no Democrat can win the presidency. Okay? Because these are states, I could pick others, but Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin that have Republican-dominated legislatures, but they all voted for Biden. The case was called, and, and the claim was the legislature could do that even if the Wisconsin Constitution, the Georgia Constitution, the Arizona Constitution, as construed by the state supreme courts of those states, said our state constitution gives this to the electorate, to the people, and not, um, oh, I, so you didn't want me to go too far back. That's the, I'm getting the feedback. And not to um, the legislature. That was the issue in a case called Moore versus Harper about a doctrine called the independent state legislature theory. Now, now that I've refreshed your recollection, how many of you heard about that last year? Because that was one of the biggest cases imaginable. The reason it wasn't the biggest is the Supreme Court didn't do, and this is a technical term, the batshit crazy thing. <laughs>
If you ask me why didn't they do it, I will tell you. Because I wrote an amicus brief that persuaded, and I did, the conservatives on the court. And we won that case, six to two. Um, and there are not one, not two, not three, there are nine podcast episodes about that that you could listen to before the, um, uh, no, 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 five or, five or six. Um, before the oral argument, after the oral argument, I went to the oral argument um, when the case came down. So I'm not seeing, I'm not, that the environmental laws are on the verge of being invalidated by the Supreme Court as somehow unconstitutional. But again, if you tell me the theory, then I'm, I, 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 but otherwise, I'm just not seeing it. And oh, there are all these people saying the sky is falling, this or that, but do they know what they're talking about? Who are these people? You, the most, your most precious resource is your time. You have to figure out who to spend time with. I have a nomination, <laughs> okay? This will take you a lot, but then you'll actually know what's in the Constitution and what's not in the Constitution, okay? So I'm skeptical of the claim that, uh, and I was just with a justice yesterday, in fact, um, and I'm skeptical of the claim that the Supreme Court is on the verge, it may be a vote or two, but I don't even know what the theory is. What's the theory? that the environmental laws are somehow unconstitutional. So I think it basically comes down to, uh, like in the WOTUS case where SCOTUS is defining what wetlands are. Oh, no, Congress is. The Supreme Court interpreted it, and if Congress wants to change its mind, it can do so tomorrow. Here's the problem. We don't control the House of Representatives. And that's not a problem of the Constitution. That's the problem of my party not winning enough votes. Mm -hmm. So the, the argument is that basically the Supreme Court is taking away the party of Congress by. There's not a single justice who said that in that case. Not one. And they'd have to have five. So I'm disagreeing with what those people told you about this being unconstitutional. I'm saying, like, it doesn't say that at all. At all. I know how to count justices on the Supreme Court. This is what I do for a living, and I'm good at it. Um, I probably have produced more Supreme Court clerks than anyone in America. And, I, and they are in all the chambers, and that's not what they said at all. They just took a statute that had an ambiguity. It was 5-4 one way under, uh, and the fifth vote was my friend Anthony Kennedy, and he comes from California, and he understands that the geography is a little different out here, and they just actually flipped it, and it's 5-4 the other way because Justice Kavanaugh didn't follow Justice Kennedy. But that's just a total statutory interpretation case. Nothing else. All right, well, the, the argument that was being made is that the Supreme Court then let's pass an unambiguous statute. Let's actually, here's a concept, let's win an election. <laughs> Big. Okay? See, I'm straight with you all. C come use the microphone, my friend. At what, say, it, say it loud so they can hear. At what point in uh, our study of the Constitution, or if at all, should we start studying the theories of constitutional interpretation? That's a great and hard question because you can't understand substance without having a method, but um, it's very different to actually test your method unless you have lots and lots of substantive knowledge. So they, they grow up together and organically. Um, um, at the beginning, probably just study outcome, outcome, outcome. And then once you know a fair number of those things, people can start, you can start to think about, well, textualism, originalism, purposivism, precedent-based analysis, um, and the rest. But start, actually, this is you know, a radical idea, by reading the Constitution and reading it really carefully. 
um, reading at least one book that walks you through the Constitution. Um, that book is entitled America's Constitution, a biography. It was written in 2005. You can get it for 12 bucks. Um, it sold 100,000 copies, which is more than any other book on the Constitution, and I'm proud to have written it. Okay, because it's written. So th start with that. And then the Supreme Court has said all sorts of things over the years, and that's taught in a class called Constitutional Law. But what the Supreme Court says, what the Constitution says, aren't always the same thing. And that's why I'd want you to start with the Constitution, and then you can begin to say, hmm, well, there's Roe versus Wade, but where's the abortion clause in the Constitution? And it's not quite there. And now you know why Dobbs actually overruled Roe. And my brother clerked for Harry Blackman, and I'm pro-choice. Okay, Constitutional law is about the interesting tension between what the words really say and what the Supreme Court has said over time. The words really said equal after the, um, the Civil War. They always did. But the court didn't do that until Brown versus Board of Education. That's the Plessy era, okay? So it said equal, and they didn't do equal. It said free speech, and yet John Adams is putting people in prison for criticizing John Adams. That's, you know, and that's the tension and, and between what the Constitution really said and sometimes what people in power really do. So you'll want to know both of those things but the amazing thing about the Constitution is you can read it start to finish in an hour. And you could reread it every week. And after three months, you'd actually kind of begin to have a sense of the thing. And if in those three months you also read either the Federalist Papers, which are 85 op-eds, newspaper essays, one a night, and or America's Constitution, a biography, Oh, you have read the text a bunch of times and listen and audio books or listen or read an exposition of the text. Oh, you'd begin to know a lot. There's this free weekly podcast. It talks about stuff in the news. The problem is you're wasting your life on reading and listening to stupid stuff. It's not making you smarter. I'm being straight with you. I, we've got three kids in college, and they're spending all their time you know, on this. And I'm using it as a tool, and they're using it as a toy, and it's not making them smarter. So Constitution presupposes a citizenry that actually is engaged and knows more about constitutional issues. And we're going to disagree than about baseball. But method eventually you're going to need to decide, you know, well, am I a textualist? Am I a, a precedent person? Yeah, you're going to need to think about those things, but it's going to be hard to think about those things unless you know a little bit of substance first, it seems to me. But the biggest issue is the tension between what the cases have said over time and what the document actually says. That's the, 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 the energizing tension in American constitutional law. Is that responsive to your question? OK. Well, I'm concerned about something I want to ask you about. So uh, the way politics is in the is toxic partisanship and biased media and everything that's going on, do you see the country moving away from the philosophy and the spirit of the Constitution? or how do you see the, the trend right now? Yes, because how would you know the spirit of the Constitution if you're not paying any attention to it? And this is how democracy dies. But you can't just blame the media or the politicians. We have to look in the mirror, my fellow Americans. Okay? What's the solution to this? My grand plan for world domination is you read the damn books. <laughs> That's why I'm giving it to you for free. Okay? But if you don't, you won't be able to actually know who's biased and who's not. Well, the mass, the majority of the people won't, don't have... Then we die as a people. Read the Federalist 55, the last paragraph. Republican government presupposes virtue more than 
any other system. You got to vote. You got to read newspapers. You've got to actually, I read newspapers that I don't like. I, you know, that's my job as a citizen. I have to show up for jury service. Okay, it requires more of people who are wealthier and freer than ever before. Look, we produced a Lincoln. Okay, and he had no formal education at all, less than a year's schooling in his entire life. The problem is not the biased media, it's us. Because we're choosing to actually fritter away our time on stuff that's not serious. And I, I don't think you have to do this all the time, okay? I'm just asking you to know as much about the Constitution as you know about baseball. And the Constitution is every bit as interesting as and boring as baseball. And baseball is actually <laughs> boring until you get into it. And then once you're getting into it, like, are they going to play the infield, you know, in or back? You know, when are we going to pull the, the starter? Are they going to, you know, put on the double? Um, uh, are they going to put on the, 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 the shift? Um, um, uh, you know, are, are they going to pitch to this guy or pitch around him? Baseball turns out to be interesting once you know enough about baseball. That's true of the Constitution as well. Um, you need to, to get into it, um, and, and you can't blame the biased media. The media has always been biased, and yet we produced an Abraham Lincoln in an era of remarkably biased media. Do you, do you see a concern in DC because you talk to these people that this is a problem or they don't even care about it? Well, but that's not. The, just the people in D.C., because someone elected those people in D.C. We actually do have free and fair elections. And if your fellow citizens, you know, see the world very differently than you do, then you have to start engaging your fellow citizens, even people who disagree with you, okay? Because, and this is harder for us than for anyone else because we are so disunited in all sorts of ways, so diverse. It's a genuine challenge. And it requires work on our part. How do you talk to about confrontation to help them understand? Oh, they don't listen to me at all. But <laughs> and I listened to my dad. I really did. Um, and I was telling someone today, my dad, I made one good decision, really good decision, the person I chose to marry. 34 years ago, and my dad told me she was a keeper, and I'd actually listened to him, okay? My children don't, but I think they will in five years. You know, they're, they're 24, 22, 22, so I can't, I can't quite, I'm gonna become a lot smarter in their eyes in the next five years, in, you know. So right now, oh, I'm 0 for 3. <laughs> I am, uh, but I have, they're all in college now, I have a lot of college kids. I have a slightly better batting average with them. Um, and I tell them what I'm just telling you, which is if you really want to, we, we have each other, uh, us, America. We have to connect with each other. This is the only thing that we have in common. So we all need to actually, it's not baseball, truthfully. And even if it were, that's not gonna help us govern and not gonna help us figure out how to think about Ukraine or Israel or, Trump versus Biden. And it, once you get into it, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, so the person, this is dedicated to several people. One of them is Lynn Miranda. And I think he's a total freaking genius. Because he's, he, if William Shakespeare were alive today, his name would be Lynn Miranda, because he's managed to make this interesting and to a younger generation, and he's taking conservative ideas, you know, how does Hamilton succeed? By, be, by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, you know, by reading, you know, every um, treatise he can get his hands on. That's a total conservative Horatio Alger just, you know, um, story. But he tells that story, with, he begins in a hip hop idiom, and he tells a story about white people, but he has black and brown actors playing this. He reaches across generations and genre. I think the opening two minutes of um, the Hamilton is pure genius because he, st he starts hip hop and it becomes um, Broadway show tune. He's got two great swear words in his first 10. How does a bastard 
orphan, son of a whore. Okay, now you got a 17 year old kid interested. <laughs> Bastard, whore, oh, yeah. You know, so my, my son, you know, he's listening to this stuff and I'm joking on him. This is, I say, you know, Vic, turn down that and then I unleash a spling of F expletives, you know, rap music. It's just all effing swear words, I say, okay? Um, and I don't say effing, okay? And he says, Dad. Shakespeare used swear words. I said, yes, but Vic, Shakespeare used other words also. Okay, so, but um, we, yes, it, it's, uh, uh, we have to make it interesting enough, truthfully, but then we have to actually, and here's the hard part. You're gonna eventually need to talk to people who totally disagree with you, whether that's at Thanksgiving or whatever, um, and that's not fun, but that's what we need to do. As Americans, that's our job. I'm actually guessing what about the someone like that. Yeah. yeah. And then I and I promise you, this does not have my politics in it. I could have there are many things that are probably wrong, but they're not about my personal views of this or that. Because who cares? I'm there are three hundred million that's not what we need. We need someone who's actually gonna try to tell us the history in a straight and interesting way. So seeing as we're all either current or future studious attorneys, and we actually acquire the knowledge, we learn about the Constitution, we learn the intricacies of it, what is the next step after that? Um, How do we jury service? Think about running for school board or city council. Um, do outreach to people in your community, um, embody uh, law at its best, people make fun of lawyers, but Thomas More, Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, all lawyers, um, you know, just um, uh, um, uh, uh, What happens when that's not enough? Well, you've done your best. You've, what else can you do? But, well, I don't insist that everyone has to do this to, to, so, uh, to the exclusion of, of living a happy life. I, my ask is that you spend as much time about this as you do on baseball or, for, or on your favorite sport. Maybe it's football, whatever. Um, and, and that's in your spare time that, 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 that this become one of your commitments or hobbies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to always say, perhaps in the red eye, why did I get in this morning? Yeah, I got in at 1 a.m. this morning, and then it was a little edgy. I got into LAX, and I, I didn't want to bake my dad up, you know, so I had booked a, um, a room in the airport hotel, but how do I get from the terminal to the airport hotel? And, and I decided, you know, it's 1 a.m., and I, I kind of do stick out, and I've got the roller board. I'm just going to walk. Oh, no. And <laughs> it turned out, it turned out just, uh, it's Century Boulevard, it turned out just fine. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I grew up about 10 minutes from there, and it's, it's not the most pleasant place. But, yeah. <laughs> but there were people right around, there were cars, <laughs> it, it was fairly well lit. It, 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 it ended well. I uh, was a student of being guardian, and, uh, and I still am. I think I'm only going to have a class with her in the future, but... She's the one who uh, kind of started this spark, a uh, constitutional spark, I guess you, you should say. So I had a question when we started. Well, doesn't this. It, as a teacher feel great right when a student says something, something like that? that? Yeah. I don't know if she's right behind you. <laughs> so when we started talking about uh, information and our, uh, our role in society, I started to think of how the founders uh, wanted to be free thinkers. Yes. Uh, they aim to create this this marketplace of ideas, uh, and you know recently we've been dealing with uh, or experiencing a you know, big information and disinformation campaign. Yes. Uh, so and it's very concerning to me. Uh, so I wanted to know what your thoughts were 
what role did our constitution play in this, or should it play in this, and what role should the government take in this yeah. particular so, <laughs> the practice more? The problem is, can you always trust the government, which may have its own agenda? So I tend to think that you, we have to, as individuals, be very sophisticated consumers of information and skeptical consumers of information. Um, and before I fork over um, money for this investment or that investment, I'm going to um, do some investigation because it's my money. And I tend to think that we have to do the same thing before I fork, fork over my vote. Um, I'm going to need to actually um, and I can do it. The Google machine makes it easier to actually vet stuff than ever before, to actually find out you know, information about which sources tend to be reliable and which ones don't. Um, but I tend to think we're, we need to do that as individuals, because what I might find reliable, you might not. I try to every day read Fox and the New York Times and um, CNN, um, and th there's a range. And what's so interesting isn't just that they cover the same stories differently, which they do. They don't even agree on what was the most important thing that happened yesterday. It's like almost all, but that's interesting in and of itself to see, ah, you know, these folks think the most important thing is a bunch of, and this is what they would say, illegals who came across and we don't even know who they are, or there's this Hunter Biden thing that's being covered up. Or, so they've got their stories every day, and then someone else has a different set of stories, but this is, this is interesting. And, and then you have to actually also say, well, because as time passes, you know, who, turned out to be more right and reliable because time passes and some people are saying pay attention to X who then goes to prison and then other people saying oh Y is the great person and you know Y turns out to um, be um, more prescient about things that they're predicting are going to happen in the world. So. Um, I'm a little bit truthfully of a skeptic, personally, of that big brother government is going to be able to um, save us from this. I think we need to be um, very self-reliant um, consumers of information. Okay, so let's do them one at a time because honestly, I'm getting old and it's hard for me to remember three things. Truth, no, truthfully, it is. On the electoral college, um, I myself don't love it, but I don't hate it. It may be the best we can do. Um, how many of you have heard of? It's a slightly screwy plan, but. Um, there's this idea that's out there that individual states could choose one by one, state legislatures, to uh, commit their electoral votes to the person who wins the national popular vote. And if enough states do that, then if you win the national popular vote, you win the electoral votes of all these states, and you win the electoral college. It's called the National Popular Vote Interstate compact. California has joined it. A whole bunch of states have joined it. And if enough do, then you'd need to um, win the national popular vote in order to win. How many of you have heard of the national popular vote interstate compact? Raise your hands high. So maybe a quarter. I invented it. It's, if you look at Wikipedia, it's called the Amar plan. And I'm not sure it's a good plan. Um, I just came up with it one day in my bathtub. It seemed kind of <laughs> an interesting idea that I had. I just you know, put it on the internet, it's like, here's a kind of interesting thought, and then all of a sudden, Arnold Schwarzenegger is signing it into law. Um, so, here's the argument for um, getting rid of the thing, either with an improvisation um, or an amendment. 
equality. One person, one vote. All votes should count equally. Here's how we do it in every state. We take all the votes. Everyone gets one vote, whether you live in a city, a suburb, um, a rural area. We add up all the votes. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Call us crazy, but that's how we do it in California and in Texas and in Pennsylvania and in Rhode Island. We don't have a little electoral college within each state. And each governor is like a little president. Four-year terms, veto pen, pardon pen in 48 of the states. So that's the argument for it. Equality and actually this is how states do it. I've just proved to you that 90% of the arguments for the Electoral College are bullshit. Because if they were good, you know, then states would do, oh, oh, fairness to rural areas or something. No, that's racially coded and that's, then, then California's picking its governor the wrong way. Here's the argument on the other side. One, inertia. It's not a perfect system, but you change the rules, you change the game, and maybe there will be unintended consequences that will make the system bad. Uh, worse. Which are they? Oh, that's the, the great thing about this Burkean argument. You don't have to specify that. You just say, we're not sure. But these pointy-headed academics, they come up with all sorts of theories, but they sometimes boomerang. That's a reason to stick with what we got. It's not great, but it could be, maybe we'll, you know, unleash, you know, some, um, the Kraken, yeah, some horrible, um, uh, um, bad consequence. Here's another argument. Picking the federal president is different than picking, federalism is the answer. States should do, uh, um, do things differently than the federal. Here are two reasons why, for example. One, Akhil, you say uniformity, but there's never going to be total uniformity because within the state, they got rules about who can vote, but the rules across states are going to vary on who can vote. California says, ah, now that we have national popular vote, we got a bright idea. We're going to let 17-year-olds vote. So that will increase our cl clout. You know, more Californians voting. So Texas says, ah, we're going to let 16-year-olds vote. And Arkansas says, ah, we're going to let dogs vote. Okay? <laughs> and you're going to need an elaborate federal system to really per you know, create true uniformity. And now here's the second part. Who's going to run that system? And if the person who runs that system is the incumbent president of the United States, and if that were Donald Trump, that would make me very nervous. Because now Georgia is not being controlled by independent Republican Party people in Georgia, like Rafsenberger, but by Donald Trump. That's not, Keel, why isn't that a problem in the states? Because in states, your AG is not controlled by your governor the same way that Bill Barr answers to Donald Trump, OK? So anyway. Um, why do we have the Electoral College? Okay, raise your hands if this is what you heard. We have the Electoral College because it's the balance between big and small states. Raise your hands if that's what you heard. That's what I was taught, and it's bogus because the big state guy always wins. Um, in all of American history, we've had three small state presidents, um, actually four, maybe Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, Zachary Taylor, and Franklin Pierce, and that's it. George Washington comes from the biggest state. Virginia, so does Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe. Um, for 32 of the first 36 years, it's a Virginian, that's your biggest state, and the other four years, it's Massachusetts, that's your second biggest state, or third, depending on you count. Big state guy, always with, that's not why you have it. You were taught that, it's bullshit. Okay? Now, this is why you need to know some history, because People are so much smarter about football. They just listen to John Madden and he explains to them like what a play action pass is and how you freeze the linebacker and you know and, and whether the guard is pulling or not. And like, oh, I now understand how a football play works. Okay? But we don't understand so it's not big state, small state. You were taught that because they really didn't believe in democracy, it's a republic and it's not a democracy. How many of you were taught that? And they didn't really okay. Well, democracy and republic are the same thing. One's Latin, one's Greek. The party that calls itself, you know, uh, the Democratic Party was alternatingly called the Republican Party, the Democratic Republicans. If this is such a bad trademark, why is the dominant political party in antebellum America it's the self-described Jacksonian Democrats? So none of that makes sense. Okay, this is what you're talking. How many of you taught we have it because of slavery? Well, this is very depressing to me because we have it because of slavery. And no one knew that 20 years ago, but now a third of the people know that that's why we had it. 
Here's why we had it. Because in a direct election world, the South loses every time because a huge percentage of its population can't vote because they're slaves. But with an electoral college, they get three-fifths credit for their slaves. That's why you have it. Oh, professor, if that were true, the big winner early on would be a, a, um, a large state with a lot of slaves. Professor. Can you spell Virginia? Yes, that's, I can spell Virginia, and that's why you have it. Okay, but if you don't know all of that, and then you can decide. I've made an argument, here's why you should change it. Equality, it's got tainted roots. Oh, we should change this stinky system. Here's why you shouldn't, because maybe actually it'll make it worse in all sorts of ways. I'm, on this one, trying to be an honest agent, I can see the argument on both sides. I've tried to give you some strong arguments on both sides. And I promise you, if you read my, just put in, in the Google machine, Akhil Amar, Electoral College, lots of stuff for you to listen to or read. Many podcast episodes on this. But most of what you were taught is false. You're taught it's a balance between big and small states. No, the House and the Senate is that, not the Electoral College so much. You're taught it's because they don't really believe in democracy. They put the damn thing to a vote up and down the continent for a year. They let you vote on Congress in the, uh, on the, for the House under the Constitution. You didn't get to do that under the Articles of Confederation. In eight of the 13 states, they got rid of the ordinary property qualifications for ordinary elections. There are no property qualifications to be a member of the House, the Senate, or to be President of the United States, and there are at the state level. Most of what you learned about republics versus democracies is bunk, okay? I, learned, I was taught the same things, but they're not true, and that's why you need actually to read and then decide for yourself with people giving you evidence. Um, I tried to give you the argument on each side. And then my other question is... What you had two more. I, that was only your first. Oh, yeah. uh, what do you think about the difference between like, state laws and election versus federal laws, and there should be a general federal law for... Um, Right, and we talked a little bit about that. The problem is if you put all your eggs in one basket and Trump controls that basket, that makes me very nervous. And the Republican would say, oh, right back at you, but just put substitute Biden, you know, for Trump. Federal system isn't perfect, but it actually is um, hedging your bets just a little bit. My last question was, what is your opinion on voter IDs? I'm in favor of free government issued identification cards. I think they'd be good for national security reasons, for immigration reasons that conservatives might like, but for democracy reasons that liberals might like. So I'm in favor of them. Um, well, some, one party doesn't want lots of people to vote um, and wants to make it harder for people to vote. Um, that party starts uh, with an R. Um, um, the other party has a bunch of folks who can be slightly nutty on privacy issues and is concerned that, oh, big government, this is the thin, you know. I. I um, have surrendered all sorts of my privacy because I want to get through airports fast. I paid $180 for the thing, but this clear, when you're in certain airports, oh my God, it saves you 45 minutes. And now they have all sorts of biometric you know, data on me. You know, they probably know things about me that my wife doesn't even know, but <laughs> you know, I'm willing to do that to save 45 minutes. But there are people who are very, very, um, uh, agitated about gov Big Brother, and they think national identity cards are too European Big Brotherish. <laughs> but thank you. Well, the R's don't want to actually have state provided voter IDs, and the R's are saying in Texas, oh, your um, uh, hunters license is a good enough ID, but not your student ID at the University of Texas. So um, just saying. Same.
Yeah, but not everyone, believe it or not, because you know, you're a Californian, okay? Go to New York, a lot of people don't drive, okay? So, um, um, so there are these complexities, and they make you stand in a long line. If you really want to do it, everyone in, at, at, in high school, as part of civics, should be just automatically signed up. I'll tell you a story. So we move from North Haven to um, Woodbridge 20 years ago. And so I get, this, I get two letters from um, uh, Connecticut. One, welcome to Woodbridge, here are your taxes. So they know I've moved, okay? <laughs> Second, from North Haven saying, we see you've left North Haven, we've canceled your voter registration, okay? And so now I'm gonna have to re-register, and that takes my time, I say, damn you people, screw you, you know, like, I'm paying you my tax money and you're just making it difficult for me. You knew that I've moved, the tax people know that I've moved. You know, I'm still in the same, I moved 10 miles and now I'm gonna have to spend three hours re-registering, okay? And um, Chase Bank doesn't make me do that, you know? And the grocery store doesn't make me do that and Amazon doesn't make me do that and Hilton Hotels don't make me do that. They make it really easy for me to do stuff. Avis rental car, so screw them. So. Um, Governments don't always make it easy for us, the sovereign citizens, to do this stuff. They make it hard in some places. And this is Connecticut, which is actually pretty um, bluish, liberal, democratic jurisdiction. They should make it much easier for us to vote, in my view. Yeah. And he's asking a second one, so those of you who haven't, you know, jump forward. But his first one is very good. Uh, this is really interesting. So, uh, with the Supreme Court, do you think that there are theories of constitutional interpretation that are a detriment to the Constitution, or a net negative, or is everything fair? Well, there are rules of constitutional interpretation, and here's what's not fair game. Professor Philip Bobbitt, it's actually Sir Philip Bobbitt, he's been on my podcast before, um, thinks that there are six classic ways of making a constitutional argument. He says you can make an argument from the text from history or original intent, from the spirit or structure or purpose, the architecture of the document as a whole, separation of powers, federalism, checks and balances, from the American tradition and spirit, he calls it the ethos, um, the American way, from um, sometimes if everything is close to being in balance, practical consequences, one uh, argument makes practical sense, another one doesn't, and um, arguments based on precedents, judicial precedents, but those aren't the only ones. Those are six different ways of making a constitutional argument, and they sometimes conflict. In 1954, the precedent is Plessy, it says segregation is okay, but the text says equal. You're gonna have to pick. Whenever there's a conflict, I pick the text because that's what we have actually committed ourselves to. That's what our oath of office is. Um, in Dobbs, the conservatives on the court said it doesn't, the, the precedent is Roe versus Wade, but the text doesn't really say abortion. We're going to go with the text. That's just a conservative version of what the liberals did in 1954, you see. So I tend, because I'm an originalist, I'm a textualist, to privilege text and history and structure over the cases because the cases can sometimes drift away from true north. Um, in the, for 50 years, in the so-called Lochner era, the court made up all sorts of things and then um, abandoned that because justice has said it doesn't say that in the text. Um, well, that's what the conservatives are saying about Roe versus Wade. And to repeat, I'm pro-choice, my brother clerked for Harry Blackman. But they have a point, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, Brown basically tosses Plessy overboard because the text really says equal. So, Bobbitt says there are six methods of constitutional interpretation. Text, history, structure, prudence or practicality, tradition or ethos or the spirit of the system, the American way, and precedence. Two points, three maybe. Those conflict sometimes. Originalists privilege text, history, and structure. Other people like Elena Kagan might privilege precedent. 
There are liberal precedent people and conservative precedent people. There are liberal originalists, Akil, Hugo Black. There are conservative originalists, Clarence Thomas. This is not the, it's the same distinction. Okay. So, one, there's six methods. Two, they conflict sometimes. Three, it's, they conflict, but it cuts across ordinary standard political ideology. And the fourth thing is, you might say, well, that's everything in the world. No. There are all sorts of things that aren't constitutional law. And when you say them, you're not doing constitutional law. If you say, this is the rule because Jesus said so, that's not constitutional law. There are societies in the world where that is constitutional law. They're theocratic societies because Allah so wills it, because it's in Quran. I'm not mocking these regimes. I'm saying in today's world, that's Sharia law. There are regimes in which appeals to religious authority or supernatural authority are permissible. We don't allow that in America. There are, you can come up again, there are countries that say because the party wants it. That's actually supreme constitutional law in China, what the Communist Party wants. It's not in America. Appeals to um, um, uh, birth and blood. I, Henry, king by the grace of God, you know, say, um, uh, d decree the following, you know, we don't have that in America, um, a rule by divine right. Or um, because um, uh, the, the, the wise men came and when I was born anointed me the Panchen Lama. Um, or, you know, because there was a, a star over my manger in Bethlehem. There are societies in the world that have um, um, appeals to blood, to um, religion, to party, to fiat. But in America, those do not count as constitutional law. Text, history, structure, or purpose, um, um, precedent, costs and benefits, if, the system, if, the, if, if they're a, a close uh, issue, um, uh, and the American tradition or spirit. That's constitutional law. That's, I've just summarized an important book by Sir Philip Bobbitt. He's actually, he was recently knighted by the crazy American called Constitutional Fate. And I hope your teacher in constitutional law taught you about these different methods. Okay. I'm saying you can't appeal to something at, on Sunday at Sunday school. I say this is what I will do because the Bible said so, because Jesus said so, you know. Um, and, and Sunday school, that's a perfectly valid argument. It's simply not a proper argument in American constitutional law in a society where some of my fellow citizens are not Christians and don't accept the authority of Jesus or the Bible because they're Buddhists, because they're Hindus, because they're atheists, and they're all, and we're all Americans. So appeals to religious authority are not constitutional or legal appeals. And there are societies in the world in which they are today, like Sharia law. Okay, so um, I think Dworkin is um, the idea of law as integrity, Ron, the great Ronald Dworkin, is an, a, a, a good and interesting idea. It's about how law fits together. Almost everything else in Ronald Dworkin's theory or approach has not aged well. It's, um, if you went, it, it, it's a little bit like moon rocks and lava lamps and bell bottoms. It's so like 1970. Um, Ronald Dworkin was a very smart guy, um, but he wasn't as smart as he thought he was. And he wasn't smarter than all of Americans put together. And he didn't spend enough time on the American constitutional story, its text, its history. He's up there in the Concord um, a, a supersonic plane shuttling back and forth between London and New York and at 40,000 feet, you know, in supersonic speed, England, America, it all kind of all looks the same to him. And that's actually not American constitutional law today. Ronald Dworkin um, taught at the Yale Law School, you know. Um, but 
He's yesterday's news, truth be told. I'm being straight with you. Um, the Supreme Court doesn't cite him, and I just told you who it does cite. I'm ridiculously proud of the fact that it cites Akhil Amar more than any other living non-emeritus scholar. Okay? So you should read these books because the Supreme Court does. And if you want to persuade them, you need to know what they think is persuasive. And they think this is persuasive across the spectrum because it's not BS and it's not ideological and it's telling the story of America. And my friend, Steve Breyer, for whom I clerked, you know, would read it. Um, and in the middle, my friend Anthony Kennedy would read it. And on the right, my friend Sam Alito or um, Clarence Thomas would read it because this is how I began. It's what we have in common as Americans. Um, if I'm just telling them about the precedents, and I could, they're going to say, dude, I wrote that precedent. Like, I don't really need you to tell me, you know, what that precedent was all about. But if I say, here's what happened in 1791, and it actually has implications for um, the independent state legislature theory, they would say, I didn't know that. And that's actually helpful when I decide Moore versus Harper. Um, the most recent, last week, I filed an amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court, my brother and I, that's about the biggest case this term, we think. It's a tax case about whether Congress can have a wealth tax. And this is a little bit like the endangered species stuff or the uh, waters of the United States. There, some justices are poised to say you can't have a wealth tax, which means that Elizabeth Warren would be, this is again a technical legal term, SOL. Um, <laughs> and I think... And a wealth tax is perfectly permissible. Now, how am I going to persuade conservatives on the Supreme Court that it's perfectly permissible? With arguments based on text, history, and structure, and 10 pages ripped almost word for word from this book, all about the biggest case that the Supreme Court ever decided before Marbury versus Madison. It was a tax case. It was argued. Only time he ever argued a case before the Supreme Court by the great Alexander Hamilton, and he won unanimously. And if you understand what Alexander Hamilton said in that case, you understand why a wealth tax is perfectly permissible. Um, and it's in a chapter called Hamilton. The book is dedicated in part to Ron Chernow, who wrote um, a biography of Hamilton, and Lynn Miranda, who you know, dramatized it for, for us all. So I'm hoping, and I'm going to be at the oral arguments on December 5th, that conservatives on the court will say a wealth tax is indeed permissible because of text, history, and structure of the Constitution, and you know will not be cited at all? Ronald Dworkin, because he had nothing <laughs> to say about this issue except of a philosophical sort that under John Rawls's you know, proper theory of justice, a wealth tax is proper. And I agree with all of that. That's just not American constitutional law any more than appeals to Koran or um, the Bible are American constitutional law because Dworkin didn't know how to play the game. And there was a moment in which he was actually um, the flavor du jour. You know, between 1973 and 1977 or something, yeah, lots of justices were grooving on Dworkin, no more. This young lady over here, and then my friend over here, you two, you had your hand up? That's this week's podcast, so you should listen to it. Um, and um, so here are two or three things I would say about the judiciary. You're right. Um, but don't think that the other branches are oh so democratic in that. Okay. And I love the, um, 
the basic mission of this school. And, and God bless you for doing this. But let's just, you know, some of you, you know, are non-traditional students. Let's actually look out there in America. What percentage of Americans above age, let's say 30, have not just some college education, but a college degree? What's the number? Just take a guess. That's high, probably 30% have a degree, maybe 35 have some college education. So 70% do not have a college degree. 70% of Americans. What percentage of the so-called House of Representatives does not have a college degree? And her name is Lauren Boebert. <laughs> okay, maybe there are two others, maybe. 70% of America, less than 1% of the House. Okay, so let's just be straight here. Um, uh, so um, uh, now, the, um, what about elite schools? You Google my name. My Wikipedia entry will come up. I have four students. I'm one person, four students who are senators of the United States. There are only 100. Yale has a ridiculous percentage of the Senate. Yale plus Harvard is a fifth of the Senate. Now, Yale plus Harvard is 80% of the Supreme Court, but still, um, so they're all elitist institutions. Let's be honest. Actually, my own view is the court is the least dysfunctional of the three branches and by a very wide margin. Um, because the House is a snake pit, the Senate can't get anything done, the presidency has lurched from Trump to Biden and no one, almost no one thinks that those were two good choices, okay? So, you know, I know which one I can't abide. I'm a Democrat, but you don't have to be. But here's what I'll tell you about the judges. Yeah, it's true that they're elitist. And I don't think they should come from two schools. But I don't think they should come from just willy-nilly. It's not supposed to look like a jury, truth be told. Um, I think there are lots of good schools. But, and Abraham Lincoln has less than a year's formal education in his life, and I think the greatest justice of the last century was Hugo Black, who had two years at you know, a not elite school, University of Alabama. So you're right, but in today's world, um, even though the great schools don't have a monopoly on excellence, um, I want smart justices, okay? Because if I have the right argument, smart people are gonna be more likely to see that I have the right argument. And so e even though it's not necessary, perhaps, if you go to a top school, not just Yale or Harvard, but a pretty impressive, that means you did very well in college. And then, actually, that's not enough. You have to do well at that law school to be on the Supreme Court today. And then you have to get a clerkship. They almost all did top clerkships. Um, uh, um, Alito, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Gorsuch did three. Kavanaugh did three. Um, uh, Kagan and uh, um, Roberts um, and KBJ did two. Breyer did one, but that was a long time ago. Um, um, Alito um, uh, did um, one. Um, uh, um, uh, okay, uh, so um, today, to be a justice, you have to actually be a very good student, work hard in high school, and impress a lot of people work hard in college and impress a lot of people across the range, do well in law school, impress a lot of people, get hired by a judge and impress a lot of other judges as you work your way up through the system. Well, that's not the worst thing in the world. Then, once you're on the Supreme Court, you, more than anyone else in Washington, you actually do your own work, you read the briefs, you listen to people on both sides, you cross the aisle more than anyone else in Washington, D.C., I won the Moore versus Harper case with three Republicans as well as three Democrats, the biggest case of his life. John Roberts actually voted with the Republicans, excuse me, with the Democrats in the Obamacare um, decision. Uh, Earl Warren was a Republican who voted California Republican with mainly Democrats. You don't see that in the Senate very much. You never see it in the House. Um, so um, they're, they're hiring smart clerks and the best of them I was just at an event with 
Brett Kavanaugh and he hires more women than men and he hires them across the political spectrum and good for him and that's not true you know, in the Senate and, and so, so it is elitist but it's also the least dysfunctional of the three. It actually is. Um, and these guys aren't perfect but I need to be straight with you. Okay, because a lot of you are doing things here because you really, especially the staff and the, and the, and, and the teachers uh, and the administrators, because you actually believe in the mission. Every one of these justices could make 10 times what they're making um, if they left tomorrow and, 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 and just cashed in. Um, most of them from the beginning had lives of public service in which the likelihood that they would ever be on the Supreme Court was very, very low. But they actually were prosecutors and public defenders and magistrates and, and, and lower court judges um, in the trenches um, uh, making less than their law clerks will make three years after graduation. You know, because big law actually has um, huge bonuses and, and things like that. Um, so, and their spouses tell them every day, these lower court judges, and I spent a lot of time with them, because they have kids in college and all the, and, um, and all the rest, their spouses tell them every day, cause, and the odds that they're ever on the Supreme Court are extremely low. You're making less than everyone who went to law school with you. Then your law clerks will make in two years. Then the lawyers who argue in front of you then you would make, if you step down tomorrow, to be an, ar an arbitrator. Um, and um, the most unkindest cut of, of all, then these good-for-nothing law professors who do nothing and they're making more than you are. So they are doing it because they're public servants who believe in this. And, and I know a lot, four senators are my students, I know a lot of senators. I don't respect them as much as I respect the average <laughs> judge or just they're not tweeting snark and dialing for dollars and doing they're actually doing work writing their own opinions with reasons and trying to listen to people on the other side I wish they had a code of ethics and I think we're gonna get one very soon I believe in term limits for justices and I have a proposal for that 18 years so I'm not saying they're perfect I'm saying I actually yes they are elitist. I don't think they should come from two schools and here's why. If they come from two schools that means they're coming a lot from one school, a very small school. That's very good for Akhil Amar because they all are going to be my students. But that's very bad for the country because um, I want them to know my stuff but I want them to know other stuff too. I think it's way too narrow if they all have the same teachers and the same training. Um, so that, again, my grand plan for world domination is actually not quite so megalomaniac as that. I think there are lots of good schools, but I do not begrudge the fact that most of them come from good schools. That said, my biggest heroes of all time are Abe Lincoln, who didn't have a day of law school, a day of college, a day of high school for that matter, a year's formal schooling his entire life, and Hugo Black, who spent two years at a school that's lower down on the um, uh, uh, ranking scale, the University of Alabama. In my view, he was the greatest justice of the 20th century, and Abraham Lincoln was the greatest lawyer ever. So I hear you. Was that an answer to your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. And then, my friend, you had the last question. Thank you for uh, inviting me um, you mentioned earlier, and you mentioned in a lot of your book, that this is the first of the division. The third one, I uh, was against modern completely. Um, it was the you of what you're going to be speaking about, and it's about the um, increase in dominance and determinants of the original institution. That's one right. of the things. Um, I'm curious if you could speak to why you believe it was at this point in our long constitutional conversation that this particular method of interpretation begins to appeal to more and more persistence. Brilliant question. I changed, so he's read the book and thank you. The, at the end of this book, I said, oh, I'm hoping if I live long enough to have two more volumes, the words that made us equal, 1840 to 1920, um, ending slavery, black civil equality, black 
political equality, women's equality, women's suffrage. And then volume three, it, this, in the next eight years, volume three would be the words that made us modern, 1920 to 2000. That's how I originally envisioned it. My publisher has already told me, Akhil, we're not gonna name the second volume the words that made us equal, because that's gonna look too sequelish, and <laughs> that's gonna um, limit the, the, the market. Um, there's this movie, it was actually called The Madness of King George, they originally were titling it The Madness of King George III. They eliminated that title because they thought stupid Americans would think this was like Jaws 3 and they would have had to have seen <laughs> Jaws 1 and Jaws 2. So, um, so the new, volume 2 has now got a different title. Um, the title is Born Equal and it's about women's equality and black equality Lincoln at the center, along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Beecher Stowe and Frederick Douglass, and it's about how we end slavery uh, and, and racial inequality and we commit ourselves to gender equality. So, so that's volume two, and I'm seeing in volume two that the greatest originalist of all time is actually Abraham Lincoln, and it's hiding in plain sight. He says stuff like, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now he's moving toward equal, but he's appealing to something that happened 87 years before. No living person in his audience could remember that because you'd have to have been probably seven years old, eight years old before you could remember something. You have to be 94 years old. There's no one you know, in his audience. He's making originalist arguments. So I'm coming to see originalism has a really important um, life, not, not just among the founders, but especially among, um, for, for, for Lincoln. It does make a comeback in the 20th century under people like Hugo Black and Ronald Reagan, and I'm going to tell their story. I do not want to be ideological. Hugo Black is a Franklin Roosevelt Democrat. Ronald Reagan is not, okay? Originalism is believing Pay, paying attention to the Constitution is something that p both parties can do, all branches um, um, across the ideological spectrum. The new volume is not, the third one is not going to be called um, the words that made us modern for the same reason it's not the words that made us equal. We'll have the same subtitle, America's Constitutional Conversation and the date. I think it's going to be called Earth's Best Hope. And it's going to have a picture of blue marble earth on it, which is a, an astonishingly beautiful picture of the planet created by NASA and Apple. Apple had to splice a whole bunch of pictures together because we are the first humans in the history of humanity to be able to see what this beautiful planet actually looks like from space. Oh, and it's so damn beautiful and we could destroy the whole thing. So, um, and so that, and, um, and, and there are different ver um, take, takes you have on the earth. This one is going to actually feature, because there are different blue marble earths, um, America, the Americas, um, Earth's Best Hope, and I'm going to use a certain font that's very NASA-like. Um, and you're going to see this is actually an American story because when I'm, I'm an immigrant kid, and I'm very proud to be an American, and when I'm nine years old, we reach the moon, and we put that, and it's an American flag that's planted there, but we say on the plaque, we, you know, here men from the planet Earth came, we came in peace for all mankind. And I believe we are, and this is a Lincoln phrase, the last best hope of Earth. Lincoln ends the Gettysburg Address by saying that we have to make sure the government of the people, by the people, for the people, as in we the people, shall not perish from the Earth, okay? Because Democracy is failing everywhere in, in, in the world. When he says that, we have to make sure it survives here. That's what he understood in 1863. I think it's in peril again. Earth's Best Hope, I think, will be the title. And it's all about what I said before, that we have to do, make this thing work, not just for ourselves, but because the world counts on us. Because we are the indispensable nation and the one genuinely multicultural nation with, with the children 
and grandchildren of all the other continents. And it's much harder for us to make it work than for anyone else. And, and originalism, of course, is going to have to resurge because we have to coordinate around something. And this, I believe, is the only thing, faute de mieux, you know, for lack of anything else that we can coordinate around, it's the only thing that we have in common. But it's not just in the 20th century that it emerges with um, Hugo Black and Ronald Reagan, and I'm a disciple of both of them. Um, but I'm seeing in the volume two, which I hadn't seen when I, when I wrote that, those words uh, uh, two years, three years ago, I see it very much in Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln loves the Constitution with a passion. He sees its flaws. It's pro-slavery. It has a fugitive slave clause. And he will enforce that because it's the law. And he's taken an oath to the whole Constitution, not just the parts that he likes. So here I end. Our country, amazingly, in the history of all countries and all centuries, we produced a Lincoln, which is astonishing. And then we picked him to lead us at our moment of greatest peril. I think no country in the world has ever done anything remotely like that. I want to figure out how that happened. I want us to see if we can do it again somehow. It's going to require us and not just like one book or one professor. But he was a very big believer. And you see it everywhere. Our fathers brought forth upon this continent. For, you know, in this era, four score and seven years ago. He understands the centrality of the American constitutional story and understands the need to fix it, to make amends because it is conceived in an original sin of enslavement. And he says, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember. Actually, the first quote is, I am naturally, from the French, Nefka, to be born, like in his viscera, in his guts, I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember a time I did not so think. Oh, and then he says, and so feel. Okay. So, are there things wrong with the thing today? Yes, there are. But you might have your views, and I might have mine, and she might have hers, and we have to all come together. So we first need to study the thing. We need to be originalists. We wouldn't be the first generation. Lincoln did it, and great people like Black, Hugo Black. And I have podcast episodes about all these folks. And um, um, Ronald Reagan did it. Um, and I, so I think volume three will now be called Earth's Best Hope. And um, I hope you judge the book by its cover, because I think the cover <laughs> is going to be really, really beautiful. You know, blue marble earth. It, no, it's, it, it's such a beautiful planet. It really is. Thank you. your wisdom, you gave us your book, but above all, you gave us your time. And it means so much to us to have you with us today. It's just a token to take back to Yale. I hope you will wear it around campus. And we're all like, what, what is this about? It's a college of law, apparel, and a hat. And just thank you again. Because, because this is a little bit more the, the common, you know, man approach. Okay. Baseball. Baseball cap. It is. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we're going to stick around for a few minutes and people have some questions. So that's all we have for this evening. Appreciate you all coming. We'll see you next time. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.